Hello, everyone. Welcome. I would like to welcome all friends of Michael Dowling, all Northwell employees, all friends of the Irish America media world, and all lovers of a good story. Um, I think we're in for a terrific hour. We have a terrific story to tell here. Um, I couldn't be happier to be with Michael Dowling in this amazing book after the roof, excuse me, after the roof caved in. And um, I, if you'll allow me just one moment here of uh, transparency for our audience, um, I want to tell everyone I don't know Michael Dowling. I have not met him in any way except we're on screen right now in the last couple of seconds. But uh, allow me a comment. Um, after reading this book, after reading this extraordinary book, uh, the most improbable life story I've read in some time, I feel like I know him very well. So, and it's someone who I would welcome as a friend and someone I would love to have a conversation with. So onward to our own conversation. <clears throat> Michael, welcome. Great to be with you. Uh, you're no longer snowbound. You look uh, hearty and well. Uh, thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Thank you very, very much. And I, too, Great. would very much like to get together and, and spend some time together. Well, again, I got to know you fairly well through your written words, and those were amazing. But let me start with the beginnings, um, your beginnings. Yeah. I, I, I researched a book about the Dust Bowl, and doing that, I met a lot of people in their last days of their lives. They lived in sod houses in the American Southwest. And this seems so preposterous to much of my audience that there were people still alive who lived in houses made out of grass. Yet here you are, very successful CEO of a big company. You lived in a under a thatched roof, yeah. a three-room house with a mud or earthen floor with um, four, four of your siblings. And it just seems to me like this is something that happened centuries ago. But here you are, a man with a living link to uh, a time that seems so long ago. But surely it's still a big part of who you are now, is it not? Oh, absolutely. You never forget those times. Um, yeah, that house I recall uh, just uh, like it was yesterday. And I actually, I built a model of that house years ago, which I have at home because I wanted to remember and I wanted to recall what it was like. So I built it just as it was, as I remembered it. I built all the furniture, uh, which is uh, uh, just the way the bedrooms were, the living room was, and the, as you said, there were only three rooms. So yes, it's very real to me. Um, it is just uh, something that I recall constantly and, re and recall about how fortunate I have been and how lucky I have been. Did you know at the time when you were a little kid growing up in this house that you were living in utter privation? Or did you not feel that? Well, I, I, I knew that we were worse off than most who lived around us. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I knew other families that were in other homes similar to mine, uh, but I, I didn't think that I lived in utter deprivation at that time. I, you know. Uh, it, it, because your, 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 your perspective is different. You couldn't compare uh, with what you had never seen. So I didn't, I didn't know any really beautiful homes. And so what I lived in, I thought was, well, we were at the bottom of the, of the totem pole, but that there were obviously um, others that were probably worse off than, than, than we were. Hmm. So you grew up in this town of Nocaderi. Right. And, um, I was impressed that the story you tell about Nockendary is not romanticized. Sometimes, you know, people put a real gloss on their stories of poverty, but there's some hard truths in here, Michael, some real hard truths, some painful things. And that's that's one of the things that really blew me away about this. You talked about uh, growing up in rural islands, saying there was, quote, an abundance of trust and an utter lack of privacy. On Saturday nights, you would take turns going outside in a freezing to cold tub of water uh -huh. to take your bath, uh -huh. such as it was. So my question is, um, poverty is not one-dimensional, is it? No, poverty is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's everything, really. Um, uh, it's just not about lack of money, uh, which we did not have much of at all. But it's also a lot of the other amenities that people take for granted these days. And, they, you know, mm -hmm. your people walk into a room and they f flip a switch and a light goes on. And, and uh, if the light doesn't go on right away or if a bulb goes out, they complain about it. But imagine walking into a room when there's no switch and no light. And I, I remember those, um, uh, those bats before on a Saturday night when it's freezing cold and you jump into cold water because there was no easy way to warm the water because what you had to do to get hot water was you had to light the fire, you had to go up the hill to get the water, bring the water down. 
uh, put it over the fire, wait for an hour or two until the, f until the fire got hot enough so you had hot water. And so you decided, ah, what the heck, we'll just jump into cold water. It toughened you up anyway. So it <laughs> wasn't, uh, you know, we didn't think it was that bad. You know, it toughened you up. You jump in fast and uh, right. you scrub yourself fast and you get out. You only had to do it, of course, once a week, which was okay. You'd never take a hot shower for granted, then you're, you strike me as that kind of man. <laughs> well, I mean, it's interesting. And in, 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 in uh, the house I live in right now, once or twice during storms, you know, we've lost power and we've lost uh, hot water. So I will just jump into the cold shower. My wife, Kathy, will look at me and she says, wow, you're crazy. How could you jump into a cold shower? I said, well, because I want to remind myself of the old days. At least I have to stand <laughs> under it this time. I wasn't sitting in it. So I, um, so I, you know, you, th these are the things that you, you just deal with. It's, right. not, it's not as bad as what people think. Also, you're very honest about your family dysfunctions, alcohol, right. emotional abuse, yeah. depression, violence. You talk about the time your brother walked away and seemed to disappear. Um, you talk about the, the mean and cruel side of, of your father and what he would do when he drank. Um, you said, quote, in the Dowling family, our lives were defined and in some, in some respects by a combination of poverty and violence. And yet here you are on the other side of all of that. So what, what advice do you have the Michael Dowling on the other side who can give people who are on the, on the side that you were on so long ago? How do you get through this? Well, how do people get through this? Well, you, uh, yeah, you, know, you, you know, your circumstances, uh, you know, happen all of the time. Uh, things happen to you. You just got to, you got to accept it. It's how you deal with the circumstances that hit you that matters. Uh, you can sit there and you can complain about it. You can whine about it. You can detract from it. You can say, oh, my God, I wish it was somewhere else, but it is here. So you deal with it. I mean, in many ways, you suck it up. Um, uh, yeah. and, and you have a little bit of resilience and tenacity, and uh, it is what it is, and that's my attitude today when people come up with difficult things, and I say, well, it is what it is, just deal with it. I mean, yeah. you can't avoid it, uh, just attack it, and do it with a sense of optimism. Just don't be depressed all the time about things that go wrong. Uh, be, be, have a positive attitude irrespective. The sense of optimism really comes through in your book. That seems right. to be one of the driving personal features of someone, again, again, I don't know you, but that clearly came through in your book, that sense of optimism. But let me pull the lens out a little broader, if I can, um, expanding on the causes of poverty. Uh, as someone in the healthcare world, you're used to connecting dots and connecting causes, causes with outcomes. You say that poverty in mid 20th century Ireland could be traced back, as with so many things, to the conflict with, with England. Now, in the United States, can you point to some larger societal causes, maybe in our history, something that we can look at um, in a similar way? Well, I think, uh, you know, um, poverty in Appalachia in the old days, uh, you know, the, the, the poverty among the minority populations, obviously post-slavery and the poverty that existed, uh, mm -hmm. poverty that existed, uh, you know, after the Great Depression. Um, there are many, many examples in the United States uh, where, uh, you know, you run through periods of history, you know, there are good times and then there are bad times. For example, right now uh, with COVID, uh, there are many, many, many families that, that whose lives got completely disrupted as a result of COVID that are now living in poverty. Um, many of them not knowing if their jobs will ever come back, if they will ever have jobs again, if their industries will ever come back. So it's not, it's not history you're talking about here, it's the present as well. And right. uh, so there's multiple examples like this um, in every country, in every society, in every culture. Hmm. Uh, class is something that we rarely talk about in the United States. We like to think we're a classless society, unlike Great Britain, of course, where it seems to be ever present. Um, but you talk about class, and you talked about, quote, an underlying class tension early on in Ireland. You said, quote, I will admit this air of superiority got under my skin. Oh, yeah. How does this still motivate you? Well, I, you know, I, this just bothered me an awful lot when I was young, when people had this air of, uh, you know, they're better, than, they're better than you, they're more sophisticated than you, just because they had some material goods that you didn't have that felt like that they were entitled. They were entitled to something that, that they indicated that you never would have. And I would get angry about this, 
And I would, uh, I know I kept it to myself a lot, but I decided that uh, I am going to break out of what currently exists in my circumstance. I am not going to be in this circumstance forever. I am going to do something, go someplace, try something different, so that I am not going to play victim. Uh, I am not going to be a victim. Uh, I am going to get out of this circumstance. One way or the other, I did not have an idea how, uh, but I remember when people would say to me, you know, uh, and there's one part of the book when a person said to me, isn't it too bad you can't ever go to college? Right. Uh, which, by the way, was probably the most motivating, one of the most motivating statements anybody ever said to me, because I remember walking back through the fields after that statement was made, and every step I took, I said to myself, I'm going to college, I'm going to college, I'm going to college, I'm going to prove I'm good enough to go to college. I am not going to take that put down as a put down, I'm going to take it as a motivator. I am going to move myself up and I'm getting to college. I had no clue how, but I knew, uh, I knew it was going to happen. One of your own teachers, someone who was impressed by your intelligence said it was useless for you to go on to secondary school because I think something to the effect of he's just going to sweep the streets anyway. Well, well, you know, you came from the lower rung of society. That's what was expected of you. I mean, uh, um, my brother had a wonderful phrase from it. He says the, the cacophony of no. Um, that was a Mr. Burke. He was head of a local uh, high, uh, elementary school and um, tough, tough individual. And had a real air of arrogance and superiority, and um, basically because I had came, come from where I came from, that's where I was supposed to be. And that was something I never accepted, never believed. Um, I, I just, I, I had moments when I hated him for it. Um, but again, I looked upon it as one of the, one, as a motivating force. I mean, it, it helped me drive to wanting to do something better for me and my family. So I, 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 I never got depressed by it, I got motivated by it. That phrase, cacophony of no, really struck with me. Um, yeah. You have a chapter titled, Cacophony of No. Um, and what you just said earlier, Michael, how old were you, and do you remember precisely when you made that determination that you were not going to be a victim of your class and your circumstances? I mean, was it, a, was it a sh an event thing or did it happen over time? Oh, I, it happened over time. Uh, you know, I watched the way my father was, was treated by others. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, even when somebody would give him, uh, you know, a horse to do some work or, uh, or I would work uh, for a farmer and the farmer would, uh, I, you know, you know not, not give you any pay for it, etc. So it was a gradual thing. There wasn't any one instance, except for one situation. I was working with a local farmer, actually a good guy, and he was putting down a cement yard and near his, the, the cow houses where he had all his animals. And it was a large, a large yard, and I was mixing the cement, which you did, of course, the, back then by hand. And, um, and I liked physical labor. I, I, you know, I loved doing the hard physical stuff. But I remember uh, I, was, I was doing it, he, would, he said to me, he said, uh, you gotta get out of here, I, I, you, you, you can do a lot better than this. And I remember saying to myself, I know, I know I can get out of here, I know that I can do a lot more than this, even though there is nothing wrong with mixing cement by hand. Uh, right. It gives teaches you good skill, I didn't, re I didn't mean that, but I knew that that's not what I was going to be doing going forward. And mm -hmm. so it was a slow, it was a slow development. There wasn't any one serious thing, I don't believe, that, that, that created that attitude. Um, uh, it, it, was a, it was a continuous effort. Um, I was working in an aluminum factory when I was young and uh, the people there knew I was going to college, but they were not. So there was some tension. Did you have that too, the people knowing that you had a little destiny ahead of you and they maybe did not? Oh, oh yeah, uh, yes, and um, it, it also happened when I came to the United States. It was interesting because I used to hang out with a lot of people. Uh, I, at one time when I was here and I was walking down in the docks and I was working at construction and um, I ended up getting to Fordham University and I ended up becoming a professor at Fordham. And uh, I remember when they found out that I was actually teaching at Fordham, their attitude totally changed. I was no longer in their view one of the guys. 
even though I was, yeah. I was just doing something else. And I had never told him that I was teaching at Fordham because I enjoyed it, the camaraderie. I enjoyed, enjoyed getting out and talking to them and uh, hanging out ever so often. But that attitude changed. And um, uh, in, in back in Nakaderi, um, most people were happy when I went off to college and they saw, they saw that, uh, that something good like this could happen. Um, but there were some people who looked at me and said, well, what, do you, what are you trying to do? You're trying to go above your status? You're trying mm -hmm. to, you know, be somebody that you're not? And I kind of would remember, like, what is that supposed to mean? I'm not. Right. Hmm. You um, said that growing up you had two great joys in life, hurling, right. which we Americans are not familiar with, but it sounds like uh, it makes the NFL look like ballet dancing. Um, and learning. Right. One left you with a lifetime of physical pain. I think you still are having trouble with your back or had right. because of all the scars right. and injuries from hurling. Um, but the other was a, was a motivator. It opened up the learning, opened up the world to you. Right. How would you rate hurling and learning in the two experiences that shaped Michael Dowling? Well, let me take the learning piece. I mean, uh, this emanated an awful lot from my mother, who was like the glue that kept the whole family together, was an unbelievable uh, individual, you know, kind and caring, uh, but somebody that loved to read. And she always had books available. And I, I recall when I would go into the, a room at nighttime and, uh, you know, using a candle, I mean, I would read. And it was one of the most pleasurable experiences because I love to read about history. And I love to read about other parts of the world. So, um, and I still, to this day, I read uh, a number of books a month. Uh, I just love to learn. It exposes you to other perspectives. It broadens your horizon. It gets you to think differently about the world. Um, and so that was, a, in many ways, that also was, a, was one of the reasons that I really desired to go to college, because I figured if you went to college, it was all about learning. You would learn more, you would be more educated, you'd get to know more than you know today. Um, and hurling on the other end, and was, um, it was also a learning experience, because it's a unique sport. It's the old traditional uh, sport, uh, thousands of years old, very, very, very physical. Um, uh, you, you, you've got to be very skilled and you've got to have a lot of courage. And uh, where I grew up in Nakadari was a very famous hurling place. I mean, it was a hurling community. Uh, to get on the local teams, uh, even at a very young age in that community, uh, was a real accomplishment. The competition was extraordinary. We had great coaches. And over the years, we won every championship year after year after year. Uh, but as you uh, when you play games like this, you learn about teamwork. Mm -hmm. You learn about commitment. You learn about helping somebody else. You learn about positional play. You learn about strategy. Uh, you learn about winning and losing. And uh, you know, what you learn from losing is as important as what you learn from winning. Uh, you've got to be on both sides of it. So every experience, you know, every day you get up, you learn. And if you're open-minded about it and you have an open perspective, every, every situation you are in is a learning experience. I imagine you also learn about how to play with broken fingers as well. Uh, well, I never, I, you know, I had busted up fingers. I never actually was, I was fortunate enough never to have a broken finger. I had a broken nose and I had lost teeth and a couple stitches here and there, but you know, I enjoyed every moment of it. Every, every <laughs> stitch I got, I enjoyed it enormously because there is nothing like playing that sport. In fact, when you get hit, you don't, it, you're so into the game, you don't even feel it. And uh, you know, you just look at your opponent and if he looks worse than you, you feel great. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I enjoyed every, every moment of that. I mean, hurling was just something I, I, I would love to do it again. I would try it again today, I suppose, if it was available around here where I live. It's just a terrific, terrific game. When I was researching my book about an Irish American, I found that one of the first things the Irish did when they immigrated to Newfoundland, which was the first real colony that the Irish ever went to, was establish a hurling club. Oh, so I, before anything else, they planted the hurling club in the new world. Yeah, and I'm trying to explain to people that have never seen it, trying to explain to people what it is is extraordinary because 
you know, they wear helmets today, but in, in, you know, in, when I played, there were no helmets, there were, you know, you had no protection, no equipment. You just had this, the, the, the hurley, which is the stick and the ball, right. and, uh, and it was fair game. And there were rules, but not that many. And, um, uh, but wonderful, athletic, wonderful athleticism. And sport is a, is a wonderful, wonderful learning experience that mm -hmm. teaches you about life. Uh, and uh, I, and I, I always am a strong advocate that everybody that has the chance should play some competitive sports, especially team sports. Here's a question. You could have turned into a bitter man. Your father didn't get the farm. Right. Your mother was deaf, I believe. Right. And yet, um, why didn't you become a bitter man? Why didn't you, what was, you know, what, you talked about your optimism, but given the circumstances that you were born into, why didn't you become a bitter man? Oh, because it's a distraction from what it is you want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you know why, why spend your energy on stuff that doesn't really make an awful lot of difference? Uh, I understood the circumstance. Uh, uh, you know, I, I had a lot of empathy for my mother. I mean, she was deaf, but she was one also taught us a wonderful lesson. She never, ever, ever would recognize that she had any form of disability. She never let her deafness ever impede anything that she ever wanted to do or could do or did do. Um, she, uh, she learned, she didn't, she, she didn't have a hearing aid that worked. She wore a hearing aid for a number of years. It never worked, but she, she was able to lip read. But she never regarded it as a, as a handicap in any way. Um, mm -hmm. My father's circumstance, I mean, obviously, it was difficult for him. Uh, you know, he was kind. He could be kind, angry, and violent all at the same time. Uh, you never know what you were going to uh, come home to or what, when he came home, you never know what kind of a person would walk in the door. Mm -hmm. um, but I, um, I, I looked upon it as that was the circumstance that uh, I was the oldest. I had a responsibility uh, to the family, and I had a responsibility to um, do something special and make a difference and do something with my life. I wasn't going to be confined to that. That was the one right. thing I knew from the very beginning. I wasn't be going to confined to that. I didn't know what other was, but this I wasn't going to be confined to. Right. So this book is really two stories. Uh, there's the Irish part of your upbringing, which to me is, again, just extraordinary because those circumstances seem so far removed from where we are now, but yet they have universal themes. But then you come to America, you go back and forth, and you before you have your real success, you're going to Fordham, you're going to school, but something else happens to you, a major life event. At age 25, you, you start to talk about falling into depression, what you say was the darkest period of your life. We're entering one of the darkest periods in American life, what um, Robert Redfield, the head of the CDC, called the most difficult time in the public health history of this nation. Um, episodes of depression have tripled, um, according to right. the anecdotes they right. put together. Right. 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 Um, how do we get through this? I mean, as a person of yourself who, who struggled with some depression, as you mentioned in the, in the book, and loneliness, and now that we're having an epidemic of depression and going through a, a dark time, can you give us any um, any guidelines or, or insights on that? And you're from your own experience. Well, I went through a bad period uh, around uh, around uh, uh, seventy five. Um, I had been here a long time. I had gone left home when I was sixteen, and actually had been by myself essentially. Um, I wasn't sure at that point. Uh, I, you know, what I was going to do next. Um, I suffered terribly from a bad back. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was in a lot of pain. And I also suffer from a lot of uh, uh, in, uh, injuries to my mouth and, and when I played sports, but I also didn't have very good teeth and I had a lot of tooth pain because one of the things going up in Ireland that you, you, you avoided at all costs was going to the dentist because mm. they'd pull a tooth without any anesthesia. And oh I, if you've had that experience, it's not a wonderful experience, I can tell you. So going to the dentist to me was, hor was horrifying. So I mm. physically was not doing well. Uh, I had longings for, go for home, of course. Um, and you go through a period when you're not so sure what the future is going to hold. And what I would say to people is that you just got to work yourself through it. Now, I didn't get any help. I didn't go for help. I didn't ask help. 
Today, I would say that if you're in that situation, you should look, look to get some professional assistance and professional help if you're in that circumstance. Uh, but you have to look, despite that, you have to look over the horizon a little bit about and be a little bit optimistic about the future and about what can happen, like post-COVID, what might be, what is out there, what can be positive. Um, uh, so for people in that circumstance today, if you clinically yourself have in some kind of a depressive, dep depression state, I do think you need professional help. But overall, as a societal thing, um, uh, out, of every, out of every bad situation, there is light at the other side. There is light at the end of the tunnel. So you've got to be looking at that. And even during those times, I would always, I remember saying to myself, you know, this will end. Uh, I will get over this. I will fight through this. And I will get to the other side, and it will be better. We know so much more about depression now, too. And I imagine when you were going through it, we, we were fairly ignorant about it. Also, there was an element of shame involved. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I would, um, you know, yeah, there was a terrible shame involved if you ask for any kind of professional help. Uh, even, you know, uh, Irish people are famous. They don't even like to ask for directions. You know, I mean, right. if I get lost and I'm driving the car, Wait, I won't ask I've for directions. I've never asked for directions. You know, when my, you know, I mean, Kathy, my wife would say to me, ask somebody. I said, no, you ask. I'm not asking. I'm going to get lost <laughs> first. And I'm going to get lost the second and the third time. Uh, mm -hmm. That's not, you know, I, maybe there's something Irish about that. I don't know for sure. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but asking for professional help, first of all, um, when I grew up, there wasn't that kind of professional help around anyway, even if you were wanted it. And maybe it was available to people higher up the echelon ladder in terms of material wealth, but I didn't know about it. I wasn't aware of it at all. Hmm. So um, you go to work in Albany for Governor Cuomo, the first right. Governor Cuomo. Yeah. Uh, again, part of this remarkable transition, I'm thinking of this kid who grew up on the, you know, the mud floor, the thatch roof, and now he's you know, working for the governor at a fairly short time um, after, you know, getting rid of all those, or, uh, leaving those circumstances. But I want to talk about the role of government. Government is criticized often as not being able to do anything. But you saw government. Your father was a laborer for the local county, I believe. Right. Um, and working for Cuomo, uh, for Governor Cuomo, you saw government and you yourself were an instigator of government as a force for good. Yes. So my question is, does government get a bad rap or is there some, you know, are we in a, leg are we in a period where we just don't trust it because of, of its failures or how should we look at this? Well, I think, I mean, to me, government uh, does get a bad rap in many, many cases. I mean, I, I you, know, you know, if you look at, um, you know, so much of the innovation that we currently take advantage of and and, and live in like highways and uh, libraries and schools. I mean, if you look at most, I mean, government was in many ways the innovator for an awful lot of that. So government and public health issues, I could go on and on. Uh, and, and I was also amazed at the number of bright, committed, dedicated, compassionate people that work in government, that give their careers to government, that believe in public service, that believe in doing good for other people. They understand that sense of community that you've, you know, you, and, and when you're in government, and, and I experience this directly, you do deal with a lot of the underbelly of society. You do deal with that which other institutions in society uh, cannot successfully deal with, whether it be the families, the church, other organizations, etc. cetera. Um, uh, but I, it, it, it has changed in the last number of years because so many people who are running for government run against it. They want to get into yeah. government by running against it. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I want to become a senator, but, uh, but you know, the, but government is terrible. Go government does awful stuff. And you actually, and I often sit there wondering, well, why the heck then are you running for government? If you hate it so much, why are you trying to get into it? And I think that creates that attitude among the public that government doesn't work as well as it should. And in many cases, it doesn't. Like every organization, there's no organization that's perfect. There's no organization that works correctly all the time. Government makes mistakes. It overregulates. It gets too micro at times, and it's all every organization, just like we are as individuals. We're also in finding that balance, you know, that balance between going too far and not far enough, um, mm -hmm. protecting the public but not overdoing it. Uh, just like us as individuals, the balance between social life and work, the balance between work and family. You know, we're all searching for that balance, and I think government is continuously doing that. But I was a strong advocate for strong government activity back then.
and still am seems, once it once yeah. it understands its role. Right. It seems to me that uh, what you've done and what people can do who appreciate government is connected it to the personal, a narrative. Your father would not have had a job without government. You, when you're working for Cuomo, you went into all these different communities, sure. disadvantaged communities, and tried to connect it to the personal. Again, when I was work, researching the Great Depression, I would talk to these old timers, and they would take me, 95 year old would take me out and show me this little bridge in a rural town, and they'd say, "We built that in the 1930s." Yeah, so hard. government wasn't some abstraction. Right. Big government politics. It was building the bridge in a little town. Right. So it seems to me you all you've known early on that the importance of talking about government is talking about it as a connecting it to the personal. Oh yes, because it's and this is you know one of the things I still do to this day is I mean I'm out among the people who do the work all the time because you can get especially if you you know you 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 get a title you get a position you sometimes can lock yourself away from reality. Uh, you know, it's like the discussion that is going on these days around COVID. What are some people think? Well, COVID doesn't really exist. It's not that bad. It's not that serious. Well, I've been out on the floors of the hospitals. I've actually seen people die. I've actually been seen, you know, people in ICUs. I've seen people being intubated. And you realize, you know, this is a human being who last week, three weeks ago, was walking around doing something. And today, look at what the situation is. And it makes it very, very, very real. Uh, you know, it's just look at the vaccine, talking about government, the vaccine that just came out a week ago. It was done, obviously, by the private sector, but the, the motivation and, and the drive behind a lot of the speed by which it happened was obviously government. But you have to make it real to yourself. You can't, uh, uh, it, it, you can't just be completely hypothetical all the time. Uh, you know, I watched my father. Uh, who, you know, had to, you know, not work after the age of 40, 42 or so because of arthritis. But he got some, you know, he got a disability check. He got, he got a, you know, what we would call a welfare check. And that's what sustained it. So I, I, I understand he was a person that loved to work, loved to work hard, uh, hated to take any help from anybody, but he needed it, he got it, and it made it very, 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 very real. Uh, this is exactly the question I was going to ask you about, Michael. Um, your father's arth arthritis, you write, quote, worsened to the point where he was pretty well crippled and could not walk right. and remained ill for the rest of his life. I believe he died at the age of 63. Right. How does this inform your view of patients in Northwell or patients elsewhere um, today? Well, why, you know, we're so lucky today compared to what what people had to experience back then and we're so lucky to be here uh, in the United States um, and of course Ireland is a different place. Uh, the, 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 the advances in science, um, uh, what we can do today medically and otherwise that you couldn't even contemplate doing back then. Um, but it gives you, my father's experience gives you a, a very under, a strong understanding and gives me a strong understanding of what it's like to go through illness. Um, what it's like to suffer, what it's like not to have the economic wherewithal to get the help that you might want to get if you had the money, to have access to the care that uh, was back in those days not available. And so when I look at the role that I have at Northwell today, a big part of my focus is to make sure that we have care accessible to people, that it's available to people, they get quick results. Uh, they don't have to wait for months and months to get an appointment. We move care out near to the close, close to the communities where people live. For those people that can't travel, we take the, the care to them, as close to them as possible, where they reside. So it, um, the fact that you've gone through circumstances like, uh, like I have and so many other people have, it gives you this sense of reality, this sense of perspective. You don't forget. Um, yes. uh, you don't diminish. Um, you don't diminish people uh, because they, are, it's, it, it, they cannot do X, Y, Z um, when you've been there yourself. So, for example, I, I, get, very, I get very annoyed when I find people um, uh, who look at new immigrants who come in and they don't understand the culture, they don't understand the habits here, and they kind of dismiss them and they say, look at that person, that person has no manners. And uh, without recognizing that they come from a society where the culture is very, very different. I had that experience when I came to the United States. 
where I would go to a person, a dinner. I remember the um, Thanksgiving dinner. I went to a family where they invited me, and I sat at the table, and they had all the utensils out, and they had a fondue, I think they call it, was on the table. I had, didn't know what it was. I was looking at what I thought was raw meat. I didn't know which fork to use. There were two forks, two knives, two spoons. I <laughs> sat there thinking, what the hell? I was looking if I had one. So which one was I going to pick up? So, you know, it teaches you a little bit to be very sensitive and to empathize uh, with right. people that come from different circumstances. And you should never forget that. No matter how, up, how high up you go in the organization, you should never, ever forget it because it just, not only as you diminish others, it diminishes you. Hmm. I, I want to expand on immigration a little bit because you talk about that quite a bit in the end and being a relatively recent immigrant. Um, I think most people in this country and most of our listeners today know that the Irish were sort of the original, you know, great unwashed immigrants. They were considered sure. the dregs of society. Sure. <laughs> These you know two million plus people had to flee during the famine. Uh, they cleaned the streets. They shoveled the poop into the river. They took care of people's babies. They dug the canals. Um, and the New York Times famously wrote in 1948 that the rich people would go down to the Lower East Side to watch the quote the pigs and the patties lie down sure. together. What we would call slumming. Just, well, let's go look at the poor Irish. Sure. Sure. And then we had a political movement, the Know Nothing Party, which was sure. formed in the United States for the explicit purpose of denying Irish of becoming citizens. It was the second largest political party in the United States for a while. So you talk about that, and you, you write that, quote, as an immigrant, I have grown increasingly uncomfortable with the anti-immigrant rhetoric in the political realm. Can you talk about this? Do you think it's just something that courses through American society, or um, how, how do you as a relatively recent immigrant help us understand this? Well, I think, you know, history repeats itself, as you know. I, you know, if you look back through history, you know, from the very, very beginning, every group that came, most of them didn't treat the group that came after with them the way that they wanted, the way that right. they should have. Uh, they were treated poorly themselves, and they would basically say, well, I look how badly I'm being treated. When a new group comes in, and they do, in many cases, similar things to the new group that comes in. Um, and that is part of history. Uh, I think that we got to continually educate. I don't think we educate people enough about the history of the United States and the history of immigration. I don't think we educate the kids that we, uh, that immigrants made this country. I don't think they know about the various sequences of immigration over the, over the periods. I think we should do a much better job. Um, uh, you know, we, we, you know we're, we're built by immigrants. Um, we're a na you know, the old phrase, we're a nation of immigrants. Uh, and, uh, you know, we see it now in our politics. Uh, you know, very, very recently, we've seen it very virulent in our politics about uh, people coming from those other places, for example, without understanding. You know, I, I always find it interesting, too, that if you look at the leaders of so many of our Silicon Valley and top technology companies today, the ones that are generating a lot of this new stuff that we find so great, so many of them are from other countries, they're immigrants. Uh, so I, I just think that we need a much more open view and a more, ad, a more open attitude towards, uh, towards immigration and understand that uh, what the United States was, how the United States was built and uh, who we are today. That I think we should be spending a lot more time educating people on. Where, but where do you think fear of immigrants comes from? Oh, I think the fear, I think, comes from, well, they're going to take my job. They're going to take my opportunity. They're going to narrow, you know, I, I'm, I'm, for, I'm for competition, except I don't want them to compete with me. Uh, I, I think it's about the, 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 the role in the labor force. Uh, they're going to take up room in my schools. Uh, and I also think, uh, you know, there is, um, you know, back in the old days, most of the people initially, you know, came from Europe. Um, now you have people coming who are different color, and, uh, different, uh, completely different cultures. Uh, I do think there is some uh, racism involved today in some of it. Um, I don't, people don't like to talk about this, but I think it's important to acknowledge it exists. Uh, we see it in some, as I said before, we see it in some of our politics. Um, and, uh, and these people are going to destroy what the United States is. And that was the issue when the Irish came to Boston. The idea was, if you look at the history, 
you know, the people that were here were saying, oh, these Irish coming, the papacy, I, and now the, the Catholics are going to destroy the basic fundamental culture that we currently have. The tenants, right. the DNA of this organization is going to be destroyed by these new immigrants coming in with a new religion. Uh, they don't look like us, they don't speak like us, et cetera, et cetera. And it's the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah, you can see the exact same u words used against them, but just substitute the group. Yes. Um, and it does seem, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, um, and then over time, of course, as this goes on, the groups kind of integrate and they begin to intermarry, and, and then uh, that gets better. But then a new group comes in and it starts all over again. I want to switch gears for a second. Uh, at Northwell, you talk about among all the transplants we do, all the surgeries we do, you say, we bring babies into the world, about 40 thousand a year um so let me ask you this what would you tell the parents of those new babies whose lives are beginning today in 2020 this most perilous year oh i would tell them that how fortunate they are um to be able to bring a new person into the world and how fortunate they have to have the opportunity to help mold that person to become a good citizen who makes a difference. Um, to gives that person the opportunity. Uh, but, to have, but also I would say that the obligation you have is extraordinary. It's just not parenting and taking care of them materially. It's your obligation you have to turn them into somebody and mold, try to mold them into somebody that understands the interdependence of all of the people that's around. Uh, the sense of community that we all want to live in, the type of world we want to create, um, and to basically to grow up to be a decent, caring, kind human being who makes a difference and mm. who leaves the world a little better, a little bit better than uh, than I. You know, as a parent, I you know I did something. I want my kids to leave the world better than the world that I gave you. When you um, had your first child. Correct me if I'm wrong. I believe Governor Cuomo sent your parents a note, something to the effect of, uh, you've been lucky to have good parents talking to the baby? Uh, yes, he wrote a note basically saying, and uh, Governor Mario Cuomo was just a wonderful individual. He said, um, welcome to the family of New York. Uh, you have chosen your parents well. I remember it vividly <laughs> because uh, it's, actually, it's actually framed in my kid's bedroom. When I read that, I said to myself, boy, they don't make politicians like that anymore. Uh, no, I mean, uh, he just absolutely phenomenal. And, uh, you know, that was one other thing that he did, which was um, pretty extraordinary. He became a very good friend of my mother's because I brought my mother here every year for about 19 years after my father died. And she would come to Albany this is when I was working in Albany. And uh, the governor became friends. He actually gave her a personal tour of the Capitol. Um, he loved the fact that she loved reading. And even though that she was deaf, this didn't impede her at all in those conversations. But they became pen pals. They wrote back and forth. And at one point, my mother wrote to the governor and said, um, uh, told the governor how proud she was of me uh, because something must have happened. And she found, she, I maybe have taught her, she found out about it. And then the governor sent me a letter and he said, uh, this, is the, this is a letter that your mother just sent to me where she's complimenting uh, you about the following. And he said, isn't it amazing how both you and I have fooled our mothers? <laughs> he, was, uh, he was quite an influence on you, wasn't he? Uh, yes, I think, you know, if I look back at the people who made the, such a huge difference, I mean, he obviously is right up there. And, for the following reason, and I think this is important also for other people. Um, yeah, you know, uh, you're, part of your role in life is to allow other people to see the possibilities that exist. Yeah. So he, um, he taught me, I, 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 mean, I, I, did not, I did not know him at all when I was hired to go into government. I had never met him, and didn't know him at all. But over the years, we got to know each other. And then he promoted me and he put me into roles where there was nothing in my background, nothing in my history, nothing in my CV that would in any way indicate that I could, have, that I could do these jobs. Yet he saw something in me and he threw me right into the, to the deep end. He said, you take on the responsibility for all of these areas. He had confidence in me. He gave me the opportunity, he opened the door. 
and uh, threw me in. I remember being like, oh my God, I'm scared. I, I got to study like crazy now because I don't know the subject matter here that well. But I learned. Uh, I educated myself. He gave me the opportunity to educate myself, which I think from, for uh, other leaders out there, other people in positions of responsibility, part of your job is to open the door for others so that they can expose to themselves their own capabilities. Uh, that in many ways is a function of leadership, allowing other people su to succeed, giving them the, the courage to succeed, and, uh, and, and providing them with that positive motivation. He did that for me, and that was extraordinary because he put me in positions that I never th ever thought I would be in, and the world opened up, and everything after that became relatively easy. You know, when you spend the time I spent in government doing what I did there, there's very little else that you can throw at me that would totally, completely throw me off. And that was all because of the chance he gave me back then. It strikes me that what you're talking about, Michael, is a quality that the best politicians have, but not that many have, which is empathy. Um, right. Franklin Roosevelt was a product of privilege, but he got polio when he was age 39. And people asked him later why he could sympathize so much with people in the Great Depression. He said, when you've spent a year on your back trying to move one of your toes, you understand people. Well, you can, um, you can relate to it. Empathy. Yeah, you can relate to it. It's not, yeah. hypoth it's not hypothetical. It's not academic. Right. Uh, right. You, can, you can really relate to it. Um, and, and, and that's a very, very important in, 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 in ingredient in any person's character. So, for example, I've often been in a restaurant and with, with, with some people, including other CEOs, and, and, um, who have been quite successful. And the waitress comes off to take the order, and the person doesn't treat the waitress well. They're dismissive of the waitress. They're, they're, they're quick with the waitress. And I, I get upset at that, and I'm thinking, wait a second. If you understand what it was like to work as a waitress, you'd have a much better appreciation for what that person's job is and what they do and what they've got to put up with. You can, you can empathize with it. You can relate to it. But many people sometimes uh, just cannot do that. And we've seen wonderful examples of that recently in our politics. A yes. complete failure nationally to empathize with uh, what's going on all around us, even to ignore the fact that it exists at all. One of the things you have to do is accept the reality uh, that are people who ignore the fact that, you know, COVID exists. And you've never seen, you know, the current leader of our country ever empathize uh, with regard to the thousands of people that died from COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. You've not seen it. And that's, that's, that's a lesson in non-leadership. In the same regard, um, you experienced a cardiac event in 2014. Yes. You uh, were working out and you felt some uh, pain in your chest and uh, the doctors later discovered that your main artery was 90% blocked. Uh, the doctor right. in your book, you say, called it a classic widow maker. Right. Um, in the same way that your hardship as a, as a young man informed your later life, how does having this cardiac event inform your life as you go through your life as a CEO of this major healthcare provider? Well, you know, you realize how fragile you are and how, did, uh, how your circumstances can change so quickly. Uh, did you think how, it was the end, by the way? Did you think you were close to... Well, I knew, I knew something was wrong for quite a while, hmm. but being stubborn Irish, I didn't do anything about it. <laughs> and there's a lesson here, don't be stubborn Irish. If you don't feel well, if you're very lethargic, you're unbelievably tired, there's no obvious reason for it, uh, you get discomfort on your chest, just go do something. Uh, there's something mm -hmm. wrong that you need prevention. You need to go to the doctor, you need to get help. You can't just sit around. And I, I experienced discomfort for quite a while. And uh, it was one of my employees who finally at work one day, uh, you know, uh, Gene Tagney, who basically emphasized that I had to go to the physician. Now, Kathy, my wife, had been telling me that. But I, you know, uh, you know, I said, I'm okay, you know, typical, I'm all right. I just, I'm working hard. I'm, I'm, you know, putting in long hours. I'm not sleeping as much as I should. That's the reason. But Gene saw something else. And Gene said, you got to go to the dock. And I did. And I was very, very lucky. I was lucky, one, to get the right physician. I was lucky to be in the right hospital, to get the right service. 
and uh, to have the right intervention. And uh, so it has made me very, very conscious of the fact that uh, you, you've got to take care of yourself. Um, uh, you, you just can't win against these issues by yourself. Uh, you need professional help and uh, prevention is important. And this is why in our cardiac program right now we do an awful lot of prevention work, et cetera. Um, because it is one of those silent killers, you know, you don't, you don't notice it and all of a sudden you're gone. And that's, uh, that, that should not happen to anybody if you, t if you did the right things to begin with. Until COVID came along, I believe it was still the number one killer of Americans, of cardiac events. Huh? Well, yeah, I mean, it goes to lifestyle and behavior, which is our, one of our biggest challenges health-wise is, right. uh, you know, we, 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 we self-inflict ourselves, you know, uh, we, we don't behave properly and, uh, and, uh, and we, need, we have an awful lot of work to do to change people's attitude about what their own responsibility is for their own health. Um, mm -hmm. It can't all be solved by the doc or the hospital. And it's what you do to yourself is the, prime, is the primary predictor of how well you're going to do, except for some genetic issues. But so much of health is, is uh, lifestyle and social and behavior. And uh, you, you, people have got to understand that they have a responsibility for their own health. In fact, if when, you ask, when you ask me, and some people do, about who are the greatest health reformers, who should reform health care, my answer is you yourself should reform health care because what you do to yourself is one of the best, is, it can be the best prevention. So you have that responsibility. It's not always saying it's somebody else's problem. You have the issue. You've got to deal with it. It's your responsibility. It's, do you see a chance for there to be a, a big reset after COVID is passed, after we've had vaccines, after we return somewhat to normal, um, a, a reset in our personal habits, the kinds of things you're talking about? Well, I, I would hope so, uh, but I, you know, the, the, the problem doesn't end when COVID is over because the economic disaster caused by COVID is going to last for another five to 10 years. Right. Uh, the unemployment, uh, the businesses that may never come back, the businesses that may close completely, um, the people that have to quit work or not ever again work. Um, so COVID is, uh, you know, when COVID is over, uh, the, the, the malaise, I think, continues for a while economically. Um, I would hope, however, that people begin to take a little bit more conscious, uh, take, 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 take it more seriously that I got to do things for themselves. Um, but I'm not overly optimistic about that. I think it's going to create, it's going to take an awful lot of encouragement by others and by others around them to help people do it. And for those of us in healthcare to continue to promote the idea of prevention more than we do today. Uh, that is an obligation responsibility of ours. People sometimes don't recognize, Michael, when we are living through a historic moment. You're a lover of history. You grew up reading history. Right. Describe this historic moment. How will we look on this 100 years from now? Well, I think, uh, uh, I, you know, I think 100 years from now, you look back, um, this obviously not the worst thing that has ever occurred in the course of history. There's been plagues and and pandemics much worse than this one. We may think it's bad right now, but in the context of history, it is not as bad as others. I think people look back at it and they'll say how, uh, given what has happened prior to this, how unprepared we were. Mm -hmm. I also, I think they'll, um, they'll think about the technological advancement and the, the, the relationship between individuals and technology has been completely changed as a result of this COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. experience. So uh, I think the nature of work is going to change. Uh, what we do technologically will change. And I would hope that we will all come out of this a little bit different, um, that we will have a different perspective on life. And I would hope that when people look back at it, they would say, well, United States, talking about the US, United States was, was smart, it learned. That's what I would hope mm -hmm. they would say. I'm not so sure that that's what's going to happen. Right. Well, I don't want to touch that one because history is not kind in some regards in that. Right. So um, our time is winding down, folks. So I want to get uh, two more sort of personal questions for you, Michael, before we go. And again, the book After the Roof Caved In is just an amazing life story, uh, whether you're Irish, uh, Hispanic, Brazilian, whatever. It's, we all have these common ties and these things that bind us. And I found that in your book. But um, 
luck is one of these things that's oversubscribed to the Irish. You always hear the luck of the Irish. Um, but luck, as they say, is also the residue of design. I want to ask you um, about this life you've had, how much of it was luck and how much of it was the residue of design. Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think that I have I benefited greatly from growing up the way I did. Um, you benefit from it. I think I did. I think yeah. it, 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 it gave me this resilience. Um, it toughens you up. Um, you when, when you know some people would look at something that happened and say that's a massive disappointment. Look how bad that was. I look at it and say yeah. it's not that bad. That is so much worse. Mm. So, um, I, I, and, it, and also poverty is a great motivator. Uh, mm. if, you, if you don't become victim to it, 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 it motivates you to, to stay away from it um, right. and to, to get out of it. So I, I, I also uh, want to say that I was also very fortunate because I had the mother I had who mm -hmm. made learning such an important part of my life. And when you broaden your perspective, you learn more, you look beyond the horizon. I remember standing on the hill in front of my house when I was young, and the, the, pitch, the views are spectacular from where I grew up. You can see forever. And I used to gaze out at the horizon, and I'd always wonder, what's beyond that? You know, I, I can see so far, but there has to be things over it. What's over it? And that's what came from you know, reading so much about history and reading Zane Gray, I used to read the books of Zane Gray on the American West when I was a kid. So all of that I think I benefited greatly from. As difficult as it was, uh, I think I benefited from it. And then I was very lucky as well. I, I, I like to work very, very hard. I, I study like crazy. Uh, but you have to be lucky. Um, and I was lucky enough to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, meet uh, uh, Mario Cuomo. Right. I was lucky enough to meet Kathy, my wife. I was lucky enough to meet Hobie Birch, head of United Church of Christ way back, who had worked in government and who had a wonderful teaching method. I mean, he just constantly expanded your way of thinking. Uh, I was lucky enough to come to Northwell. I've been very lucky to have fabulous staff at Northwell. Um, so in many ways, um, look plays a major role, but you also can create your, look, your own look as well. So what I tell people all the time, if somebody opens a door for you, walk through. Hmm. Don't sit there thinking, I don't think I can. Oh, it's going to be too difficult. Oh, this is going to be hard. I'm not sure which is the other side. My attitude is walk through and go find out. You can adjust, you can adapt, uh, you can tackle it, you can win. Um, you don't take defeat easily. Um, so uh, I, I, I think the opportunities for people are just absolutely phenomenal. And as long as you don't play a victim, I like, right. oh my God, look what's happening to me. You know, mm -hmm. get over it. Or uh, look how difficult life is. Life isn't that difficult, even the pandemic now. People say, oh my God, I gotta wear a mask. Wear the mask, how difficult is it to wear a mask? It's not hard, or I can't have Thanksgiving. Get over it. You'll get back to Thanksgiving next year. Or Christmas, I'll have less family together. And that's difficult, you like to be around with family, but you can Zoom your family. Uh, look at it with a positive attitude. Next year, you'll have your family back if you behave today. So don't just wallow in self-pity. Um, just, uh, you, know, you know, you attack the future. Uh, right. Just grab it and take hold and go through it. And um, it may hurt along the way, but that just toughens you up. Well, I asked that question because I, I thought at the end of your book, you couldn't possibly have planned this life. I, I, I had no clue what my life was gonna be, life, be like. Mm -hmm. I knew, however, it was going to be better than what I had. That I knew. You did know that? I knew that because I was going to make it better than what it was. Mm. Um, I, I, I was going to behave differently. I was going to get an education. 
I was going to get as much education as I possibly could. I was going to leave the Nocadere circumstance. I was going to leave that place. I knew that from a very young age. And I knew that I would be better. I didn't know exactly what. I didn't realize I'd end up in government. I didn't realize I'd be in health care, etc. cetera. Um, but as people, as I said before, as people open doors for you, you just go. And uh, you, don't, you don't look back. I, I'm one that doesn't, when people say to me, you know, what would you have done two years ago differently? I, I say I may have, but the two years ago is gone. It's what I do tomorrow makes the difference. Uh, I should have learned from what I did two years ago so I can change tomorrow, but I can't change the past. Uh, just go forward, but go forward with a sense of optimism and be positive, positive attitude, and also be kind and be a nice person. Mm. Try to help other people yeah. and make a difference. Be a decent human being. Have a level of decency about yourself. Be a trustworthy. Uh, if, you give your, if you shake somebody's hand, it's a, it's a contract. Um, th those are the things that are important. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's kind of simple. Um, uh, but um, you're, 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 you, can, you can become, you can get into con get in control of your circumstance. Take control of your circumstance. And uh, you know, as I, I think I said at the very beginning, it's not what happens to you that matters, it's how you react to it. Bad things happen to us all the time. Control how you react to it. You can't control what happens to you. Control how you react to it. Hmm. Well, it's great stuff. Um, I'm so sorry our hour is up because uh, I feel like I could just spend an hour on what got you to age 25 and then another hour on after that. The book is remarkable. Um, I look forward to the sequel, what you write uh, after the next 30 years of your life has passed because uh, the uh, prologue is destiny. It looks like, it sounds like the sequel will be remarkable as well. A great pleasure, Michael. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks to everyone uh, who listened to us today and uh, happy holidays to all.